Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I want to try to bring us to the end of chapter 1 in Galatians. Uh, this may not be that long of a video, uh, but uh, I don't want to yet, I'm not really prepared to go into chapter 2. For those of you who are uh, just coming on to this, we've uh, been studying together in the epistle to the Galatians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were somewhere in the area of verse 18 of chapter 1. Verse 18 of chapter 1. Now just by way of review, uh, this, this opening chapter to Galatians has been quite, I guess the word would be eye-opening. Paul is an apostle, not one of the original 11 or 12 apostles. Uh, he's writing to the churches at Galatia, that's churches plural. This is not, is unlike any other epistle where that you know such as the, you know the uh, letter to the uh, Corinthians or the Philippians or whatever these are the churches at Galatia so it's plural there was something taking place there early on uh, in uh, the life of the church and as I pointed out there's there's two major attacks against Christianity one is taking away from the good news of Jesus Christ or the gospel or taking away from the Word of God. Uh, an example of that would be, well, Jesus was, you know, He's a great person, but He wasn't God Almighty and incarnate in human flesh. So you've taken away uh, from that. The other, which Paul tends to address here, is the adding to the finished work of Jesus Christ. He's writing to these churches, and in verse 3, it's grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Right away, all the glory is ascribed to God, to Christ. Uh, we're not looking at any human merit at all. I think the Holy Spirit's intention was to point out, uh, bring our attention to the fact that, of uh, surrounding Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. And when I talk about the word conversion, I'm not talking about redemption. Paul was redeemed before his conversion on the road to Damascus. This is something that we need to really take serious note of. He wasn't... It wasn't at that time that Paul made some decision to follow Christ. It was not according to Paul's will that he come to know Christ. And keep in mind, as I pointed out, Paul is a pattern for those who would hereafter believe. That includes you and I. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says that the gospel that he preached was not after man. It was not according to man. Not man's good news. I'm going to suggest that in the main, Christianity today, which I believe is bordering on a departure from the faith, has been for many years, probably long before you were born, but we were born into a period in which uh, I believe is, is an age of apostasy. There's been a departure from the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And modern Christianity today looks at the good news as something other than what it is. And the Holy Spirit is giving us through the Apostle Paul to the Galatians a dire warning against preaching any gospel other than that which we receive. The text makes it clear that, and we saw in, in verse 15, that Paul was separated from his mother's womb, called by his grace. 
And I suggest that if Paul had died when he was 12 years old or three years old, he would have went to heaven. As soon as Christ revealed Himself to him, he didn't immediately confer with the flesh and blood. Now, keep in mind, the Apostle Paul was, uh, well, he was many things. He was the chief, he, the chief of all sinners because he persecuted the church of God. He was, he was formerly a Pharisee of, Pharisee, of Pharisees. He was uh, uh, zealous for the tradition of his fathers, which is different, as I pointed out, different than keeping the law. In no way did Paul go around persecuting the early church or persecuting Christians because they, they failed to keep the law. It was the tradition of his fathers. I believe that we can see a direct connection to the present day, uh, I guess what you'd, you'd say, mess of Christianity, which is more interested in the tradition of our fathers. I don't know how many people I've talked to who've said, well, uh, Steve, I, I hear you what you're saying, but... This is not what my father taught me or my parents taught me or my, it's not what my pastor teaches or, or whatever. Now when we get down to uh, verse 18, then after three years I went up to Jerusalem. This is talking about after his conversion on the road to Damascus. I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter to see Peter. Now we'll see later on in the epistle the conflict that existed between Paul's theology and Peter's. But this is who he wanted to see. This is who God wanted Paul to see. The text says he abode with him 15 days, but other of the apostles saw I none except James, the Lord's brother, now the things which are right unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. That's an oath. Now, I've, I've actually made videos on, on how that we're not to make oaths. You know, we don't, we don't live according to our, you know, the oaths that we make. Like, you know, I'm going to make a vow. Uh, you know, that's not, that's not what we as Christians do. But this is not the same thing as, as I'll try to point out. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face under the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. Unknown by face. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which he once destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Okay? Okay. Now, you could read that verse and you could say, well, you know, and I can hear it now. Well, Steve, uh, uh, Paul made a decision to follow Christ. And as a result of that, the church was just thrilled to death that he had done that. And so they glorified God because of that. And you see a lot of that today. I do not believe that that's what the verse is saying. Here's how I would like to approach this last part of chapter 1. If you, as a believer in Christ, I want you to, to think about this. Spend, at least spend some time thinking about this. If you have known the grace of God that results in the conversion of one who was always God's child, always a member of God's family. Now, I'm not talking about a goat becoming a sheep. I'm not talking about tear becoming wheat. I'm not talking about a non-believer becoming a believer by anything that that, that person did. I'm talking about the grace that results in the conversion of one who was always God's, a conversion, okay? Not, a, not redemption, but a conversion. Now, if, if, this is, if you have known this, well, I've, I've got something to say about that. If, you've, if you have known the grace that leads to the Scriptures coming alive 
I believe that, that the three years that Paul spent in the desert, in, in Arabia, I believe he's, he knew the, the Old Testament Scriptures. He could quote them forwards and backwards. That, that's kind of hard for many of us to believe, but it's true. If you've known that the grace that leads to the Scriptures coming alive, as they did with Paul after his conversion experience, uh, whereas before those Scriptures were confusing or misleading, if that is you, well, I'll, I'll get to this. Just bear with me. Think of Paul, all right? Three years, isolated study. Before meeting with anyone, to come to believe that everything that you had believed, everything that you had done was wrong. But then you come to see the, the Christ of, 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 of Scripture. You see Christ in the Scripture. You see Christ in the Old Testament. The, the noble Berean, you, you could call Paul that. I think we have every right to do that. If your conversion drove you to study the Scriptures, I'm not talking about your redemption. I'm not talking about you being born again. I, and there's we've got to make a distinction here. There are people who are born again and they're driven to study the Scriptures. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone, maybe perhaps you knew that you were the Lord's, perhaps you didn't know that you were the Lord's, but your conversion drove you to study. If that's you, well, I've, I've got something to say. Paul did not receive the gospel from men, not, it's a strong negative in the Greek, not from any of the apostles but from God. Paul came to realize that he didn't receive that gospel from men, that good news from men, but from God. If that's you, well, just bear with me. We're, we're going somewhere with this. Grace and grace alone led Paul to only Peter and James, the Lord's brother. Not the experts. Not, not the experts to hear what they thought, hear what they believed. Fifteen days with Peter. I, I can only imagine what they talked about. You know, uh, the temptation is to read in between the lines, you know, somewhat. I guess it doesn't hurt to imagine you know, what they must have talked about. I don't know how that conversation went, but I'm sure it was very interesting. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. He didn't receive the gospel from men, nor any of the other apostles, but from God. He knew that it, it was from God, not man, and we're talking about someone who was zealous for the tradition of his fathers. If that's you, well, hang in there. I've got something to say. There was no suspicion on, on the part, the text makes it clear, there was no suspicion on the part of the brethren that Paul was someone to fear. You would think that that was the case. I mean, he went around killing. He was, he was present at the, the stoning, the martyrdom of the first Christian, Stephen. And he went about it zealously. Out of ignorance. But there's no suspicion on the part of the brethren that Paul was somebody to be afraid of. Just absolute confidence. Absolute confidence. Zero doubt. No doubt whatsoever that Paul's conversion was real. If that's you, if you've ever been on either side of that equation, if you've ever experienced that in your life, I've got something to say to you. 
If that's you, you understand the grace of God. And you understand the message, the passage that we're looking at. Paul's phrase, I lie not, seems to infer that he expected some would not believe that what he wrote in this chapter was true. Keep in mind, Paul's credentials were at stake. But he doesn't appeal to his education, his being a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He doesn't appeal on the basis of his position, his authority as one who was a member of the Sanhedrin. He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't appeal to his education, his position as, as, as a testimony to the truth, but he appeals to God as his witness. And as I pointed out, the phrase there in Greek, it is an oath. The only oath that we're allowed to take. God's Word over man's. Now, if that sounds like you, you understand this verse. Paul received information concerning the truth of Christianity from no human being at all. And he was a pattern to us who believe. There is such a thing as spiritual enlightenment. God opening up the Scriptures to our understanding to where we understand them as He does. There's a difference between, folks, between propositional revelation. That's just mere facts, okay? I mean, you can know all the Greek in the world and go straight to hell. Just because you, you, un, you, you know facts, okay? I mean, Jesus lived, He died, He was buried, He was raised. That doesn't mean that, that you've been enlightened by the Holy Spirit to trust God concerning those truths. Paul received information of the truth about Christianity from no, no one, no human being. He, did, he, did, he had consulted no one in regard to its nature. The same is true in our case God the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to the truth, not men, not men. We're not persuaded by men. We are not persuaded by men. And if you relate to that, if your life reflects that, then it is in absolute harmony with this verse. All Christians, since the beginning of, of the church, who are converted... I'm not talking about born again. I'm not talking about redeemed. I'm talking about conversion. I'm talking about repentance, a change of mind from one thing to the other. And in this case, it's human merit to the, to the finished work of Christ. That's putting it as simply as I know how. All Christians who are converted are called by the grace of God. Nothing else. Their conversion is brought about by His power and grace working in them. Paul instantly, without hesitation, came to disregard his worldly interests. Uh, There's no desire for personal credit or recognition. Uh, an absolute disregard for his personal comfort. In fact, I'll even go as far as to say a disregard for his own life itself. That is a rare thing within Christianity today, but perhaps you relate to that. I know there are many Christians who do. Um, think of it. You know, the thanksgiving and the joy that there is to believers in Christ when they hear of such instances of grace that occur in the lives of other Christians. Most Christians who grow and mature, they come out of that world system based on human merit. They come out of that. We're actually commanded to come out and be separate from that world system. That's what... That's what God calls us out away from to Himself and what He did. Where it's no longer about what we do or what we did.
I, I can't imagine. I, 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 I can I'll honestly say that I can, I can understand the experience, the thanksgiving and joy there is to, to, to me when I hear of, of believers coming to turn from law to grace. But, and imagine this, whether they have ever seen them or not, Never seen them face to face. That's kind of the way it is here, you know, with this, with the internet kind of thing. I mean, you know, Facebook, you know, group. Most of my followers, I, 99.9%, .9 I've never met. Probably never will, this side of heaven. But there's this absolute assurance, this absolute confidence that we glory in because we know, we look, and, and we see how God has worked in their lives. It's, you could almost say it's, it's what the Christian lives for. It's, if you're so self-centered that all you care about, well, I, you know, I, Steve, all I care, I just hope I make it to heaven, then you don't understand that. They glorified God, these churches, the churches in Judea, for His power and mercy in saving Paul. Not redeeming him, but converting him. If you've known that, if you've been on either side of that, and you know that Paul is said to be a pattern of all those who would hereafter believe, if these truths reflect your life, then your life, dearly beloved, mirrors the first chapter of Galatians that we've been studying. I'm seeing in the last several verses of Galatians chapter 1 that when they heard about Paul's conversion, the church glorified God for the grace. So they didn't glorify God for what that some individual did. They glorified God for the grace so greatly bestowed upon one who was the chief of all sinners. Imagine this having persecuted the church of God, put Christians to death. Okay? Now, now think of what the present day application of that verse says in your life. God took the... Look at what the text is saying, folks. God took the least and made Him the greatest. No, no one. No one wrote as many epistles as Paul. No one was given as much revelation as Paul. As I pointed out in the last video, no one, no one, no apostle, no prophet, no Old Testament prophet, no one was given the revelation that was given to Paul as much as was given to Paul. God blessed Paul abundantly. He used him mightily. So mightily that here 2,000 later, you got this dumb okie here, you know, over here talking to you about it. That's he used him so mightily. So without those thirteen epistles, we wouldn't we wouldn't have the doctrine that we have. We wouldn't understand. That we wouldn't even under, comprehend. We would have no knowledge of or comprehend. Be able to comprehend the finished work of Jesus Christ. He used him in a mighty, mighty way. Uh, People have often asked me, you know, who, who would you like to see first in heaven? I, the Apostle Paul. That's, that would be my preference. I, it's, uh, and it's not because of, well, Paul was a super, super duper guy. I mean, you know, Superman kind of a guy. And, and you know, he was just a, such an extraordinary individual. He was, he was different than most people and it was all because of Paul. No, no. He was the chief of all sinners. God took the least and made him the greatest. That is one reason, folks, why I don't care about y'all's past. I don't care what you've done. Steve, you just, Steve, man, if you just only knew what I've done. I don't care. I don't care. And it has to be said that we glorify God when we hear about one of His people being converted from law to grace. That's an imperfect indicative, by the way. The imperfect tense. They, the, the imperfect tense says that they began, the churches at Judea, they began glorifying God and they continued doing so. 
I was personally unknown, however, to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the account the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith, faith that he once tried to destroy. There's a lot to be said about that. If, if you are living under that system based on human merit, that theological system, a world religious system based on human merit, whether, whether it's Christianity or any other religion in just about every other, well, I won't say just about, all other religions are based on human merit. This is what sets Christianity apart from all other religions. It's what makes Christianity not a religion. It's not a religion. You know, a lot of Christians are familiar with the phrase, well, you know, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. And, and they're so right. It's not a religion. They shouldn't even include it in courses in Bible college, you know, Christianity. Throw, throw that in with all the rest of the religions and call it, you know, well, it's just one, one, one more religion. And most of the world views Christianity as just that. It's just another religion. It's not a religion at all. It is unique in the sense that it is not based on human merit. Primitive tribes, their religions, their, their occultic beliefs and stuff, it was all based on human merit. You had to appease an angry God. You had to climb up a, a mountain and throw your child in a volcano as a sacrifice to, a, to appease an angry God. What, tell me, folks, I, look, I, I understand that Christians don't do that today, but you're basically doing the same thing if you live your life in such a way as you think that you have to gain merit, gain favor with God by what you do. They glorified God because of me. We, we don't glorify Paul. Paul didn't glorify himself. We don't glorify Paul. The Holy Spirit certain didn't, certainly didn't glorify him. Paul, you're looking at the chief of all sinners. Uh, let me put that down. The chief of all sinners who received the greatest, more revelation than anyone else. Now, folks, I mean, this is how the chapter ends. I think it's extraordinary myself. I think it's amazing. It's ama an amazing passage of grace just in the first chapter of Galatians, which, which was written, the entire epistle was, of Galatians was written to address the problem of legalism in the early church where it crept in early and it still remains to this day. And that's what I want you to understand about the first chapter of Galatians. I love you all. I truly do. Next, next Sunday, hopefully, Lord willing, we'll go into the second chapter and we'll continue on in looking at, at what God has to say to us through this amazing epistle. Rest in Him. If, if, if you do nothing else, rest in what Christ has done for you. Though He slay me, yet will I trust in Him. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into Your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that You give us, You continue to give us to come together and study Your Word, to fellowship together over Your Word, to feast upon it. May the Holy Spirit open our eyes to the truth of Your Word. May You filter out all of that which is foolish and ignorant, just sealing to our hearts the truth of Your Word, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.